for coming. My name is Jenny Tirkonen. Uh, I will be talking about uh, real-time vertex painting techniques today. <laughs> Happy to see so many people interested on this uh, rather niche topic. <laughs> uh, here is uh, a short um, table of contents, uh, what the presentation is uh, about. First, I'm going to tell a little bit about my own background and my previous works. And uh, then I'll introduce my topic, like uh, I, I will argue, argue why on earth I chose this topic, <laughs> uh, and a little bit of history of vertex colors. And um, I'll also present you a case study, Hotel Hideaway, a mobile game by Sulake. It's a Finnish uh, company. And first, uh, after that, we'll take a look at the uh, classic vertex painting, like um, things I've learned in uh, real real-time uh, games productions, uh, like uh, do's and don'ts and practical tips and then I'll do some troubleshooting, like um, what, what are common problems when you want to work with vertex colors and you get these weird errors and get frustrated and don't want to work with them anymore. So I'll give like um, common solutions to those so you don't have to spend three hours Googling. <laughs> and after that, I will um, take a look at vertex colors as like information maps, like uh, how a programmer would look at them, like. Um, how you can drive shaders with them and uh, optimize stuff so your game runs better. <laughs> and I'll give you a few shader examples I have built myself and uh, problems I have come across and uh, how to work around those problems. <laughs> and then a few um, last words after that. <laughs> last words always sound so ominous. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, without <laughs> further ado, uh, let's go. <laughs> so uh, I'm Jenny Tirkonen. Nice to meet everybody. Um, I'm a senior 3D game artist from Finland. <laughs> Uh, I have studied at Metropolia University of Applied Sciences. I have a BA in art. Uh, my uh, major was 3D visualization. I'm a proud Blender user since 2.5, <laughs> so I'm super old. <laughs> and I always talk too fast when I get carried away when I'm talking about interesting stuff. And I, I think like half of my friends have ADHD, so they don't mind. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Um, I'm too curious about everything. All the programmers in all, all the companies I worked for hate me because I keep asking why, 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 like <laughs> until they get tired of me. I really like cats. <laughs> and um, I have a secret passion for sewing clothes because sometimes it's nice to do something tangible with your hands when you work with computers. Like all day, it's nice to like uh, feel something real in your hands. So I like uh, sewing clothes. It's my secret happy place. <laughs> but that's a secret. Mm. And if you want to check some of my uh, previous works, uh, you can find my uh, personal portfolio put at my uh, website and art station. If you want to see stuff I've done previously, I'm, um, my workflow, uh, my, my uh, style is quite uh, stylized and colorful, and um, I, I like making uh, funny animal characters. <laughs> so you can check that out if you want. Uh, so uh, about this uh, little, little bit, bit about this topic. Um, so the first question is probably, uh, why would you talk about this? <laughs> why on earth? So um, based on my previous work history, I have worked um, in, in projects where vertex painting was uh, very much used. And up to the point that technique actually came sort of a weird comfort zone for me. So I use it a lot even today. I just find it super fast blocking tool and it's like very convenient way to avoid <laughs> unwrapping when you just want to have stuff done fast. And uh, people think it's really niche these days, but it's actually like really highly used technique in games. Like uh, it's sort of like one of those invisible things in games. It's usually the answer is like so often it's, it's always vertex colors. <laughs> and uh, this stuff is actually surprisingly hard to find uh, information about. Like I said, uh, I don't want uh, everybody Googling hours on <laughs> end. You can see like a little bit here and a little bit there, but like uh, I wanted to do like a nice like uh, information package on this topic because I think it's just hard to find. And um, one another point also is that uh, every, uh, this is my third Blender conference and um, I see so many like uh, awesome uh, animation showcases here. I love them. They are, they are absolutely beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous, but I don't see th so much stuff about games. And I just came here to tell that the uh, game industry loves Blender too. <laughs> we love it very much. <laughs> and I just came here to say that. <laughs> so what is vertex painting in the end? Um, in a certain way, uh, vertex is the smallest true unit of 3D. Uh, when, when I started working with one of my previous uh, positions, uh, 
the company used to measure things by a number of vertices, like ver vertex count in instead of poly count. And I told the technical artist that I'm having trouble processing this. I'm having trouble understanding like uh, how much is this because I, I have always thought about the uh, polys and not vertices. And that's when he told me that uh, why he thinks it's better to think in vertices is because it's the smallest true unit there is like a vertex is a, according to Wikipedia uh, where these um, definitions are from vertex is the position of a point in 2D or 3D space and edge is a line connecting those points and polygon is the shape between those lines so in the end the only true unit is the vertex <laughs> in 3D and that a sentence sort of um, stuck with me because uh, I, after that I started to think in <laughs> vertices as well because that, um, that, that really stuck with me and I wanted to tell you guys that as well. And um, Vertex painting is sort of like the earliest form of texturing. Uh, it was super popular in the early uh, 90s and early 2000s even because it required so much less computing power than displaying textures. like. Uh, a lot of people don't know it, but uh, many times the textures are actually a bigger expense than any amount of geometry is. Like you can pump so much geometry and it's still cheaper than using a 4K texture. And I don't think a lot of people know that necessarily. Uh, it might be a bit different for PC, but at least in, in mobile, it's like 90% of the time the texture is the bigger problem than any poly count would be. And Vertice painting is uh, always sharp, and when you had like really limited amount of uh, texturing space, like really small sizes, it, it, this stuff is like always sharp. No matter how close you zoom, everything is always sharp. And there was a time when this was a huge benefit, and it was like really attractive cho choice, especially if your style is like uh, really stylized. So. You want to go for like really uh, stylized look anyway, so you can do surprisingly a lot with just like uh, gradients. Like if you take a look at this uh, fruit, a nice little fruit bowl I have here, like all the fruits, they are just like uh, vertex colors and uh, they, they, they look surprisingly okay. There's not a single texture in this image. Yeah. Uh, so um, I have a case study with me here today. Um, I, I have been working for uh, Sulake, it's a Finnish uh, mobile games company from 2018 to 2021, so nearly four years. I worked for Hotel Hideaway, it's a virtual um, chat game um, yeah, that, that you play with your cell phone. It's like uh, this full 3D world where you have your own room and you can put clothes on your character and decorate your room and uh, chat with other players. <laughs> It's uh, by style, it's this sort of like a art deco roaring 20s feel to it. <laughs> and it has like uh, these subtle hints uh, of fut futurism if you know the lore of the game. And it was published 2018. And it's the spiritual successor of Habbo Hotel. I, I think some of you might not know it. It was this pixel art uh, online chat. It was very famous back in the day. <laughs> and. Um, what is interesting about Hotel Hideaway is that they only used the vertex-based shaders and I think they were able to do really impressive stuff with that. And that's what I want to show you guys today. Uh, the assets uh, I'll be showing are my personal uh, work from during my era with Sulake. Um, they are mostly like low poly or mid poly models. And well, of course, it depends like if you work in a PC or mobile, what is your definition of mid poly? But um, uh, it's something like this, that uh, we had two main uh, production lines. We had uh, clothing for the characters that people were able to, the players were able to buy or uh, win or um, get gifted. We had like, uh, that, that, that was the most popular series of products. We had like seasonal collections and uh, I worked on those uh, a long time. And another line of uh, Assets was the furniture that players could uh, buy and uh, win and uh, be, had, had gifted them to, to decorate their rooms with. So we had like a new collection every, every month. So I was working a lot on this uh, DLC <laughs> content that players could, could get to themselves. And here you can see some of my wireframes, like uh, what is um, the poly count about. Uh, so you can see that the character meshes are slightly denser than the furniture. We didn't have like a hard limit for vertices, but uh, we were instructed that we, we, we just use the amount that 
it makes it look nice, but the, there was like no hard limit. We, we just we just thought to be reasonable. <laughs> so uh, first, I would like to talk about uh, classic vertex painting, like uh, how many people think when I say vertex painting, like uh, you go to vertex paint mode and slap on some color. <laughs> so um, what, what are like good case studies? What, what are good use cases for vertex colors? Uh, usually in mobile, th this is um, well, what you would use vertex colors for is like um, stylized games. Like you can do surprisingly a lot with just gradients in the end. And low end devices, because it's so much more affordable than textures, and you can get you can do like almost all the things you could do with te textures, but so much cheaper. And th there are like certain materials that are very believable. Like you can do like really nice looking ice or glass with just using like unlit, unlit material, and then just hand painting vertex colors to it. It's surprisingly believable. <laughs> and another good case study is like. Um, emissive materials, you can create this illusion of light, illusion of emissive and like neon is super believable often. And then it can act like as a cheap ambient occlusion that you would paint ambient occlusion and then you would take it to the shader and put it on multiply on top of your like textures or other vertex colors and it, it looks surprisingly okay. And I, I thought this um, machine I made for Hotel Hideaway was surprisingly a uh, good example of that because it has the neon and it has a little bit of glass going on and it has uh, this uh, glassy lo logo and everything. So that's mainly what we did for Hotel Hideaway. The things that, that the arrows point at, that we, we try to get the feel of uh, translucent ice or glass or neon or cheap ambient occlusion. <laughs> and here is a uh, short list of my uh, hard <laughs> learned do's and don'ts from my time with Hotel Hideaway. Um, I'll start with the do's. Um, always have a logic, always. Like uh, it, it doesn't matter which one, like uh, are you following a certain type of lighting and sort of enhancing it with your colors or are you making an AO map out of your vertex colors and multiplying it on top of something else? It's like uh, just as long as you have a logic, it, it, it's, it's all good. Just decide what, what to use them for and uh, follow that. And another thing is that you should always make um, color themes, uh, like palette, palettes for yourself. So if, if you are working on like multiple assets, you always have the certain colors so you don't sort of like start getting variation between asset to asset. So I, I recommend definitely doing like color palettes and then sharing them with all the artists. And, also, I think you should uh, think in numbers because uh, it, the human error is a surprisingly big problem in a production <laughs> that if I tell somebody that uh, to put, put mid, mid gray in it, that uh, might be understood really differently. But I, I say put 0 0.5 darkness to your ambient, it, it, it won't get, the, 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 it's very, it's not as likely to be mis misunderstood. So I, that's something I learned pretty fast. And, when I'm working with uh, vertex colors, I, I will always work with uh, unlit and paint a little. Then I take a look at, at my material in lit and see, see if it's going to the right direction. But if you work in lit, it's uh, the lighting sort of um, messes your sense of color pretty easily. So I would definitely recommend working with uh, un unlit to avoid visual distractions. But you still need to check like regularly that you are going to the right direction because uh, when you work with unlit, uh, even like subtle changes might look huge, but then you put lights on and realize that you cannot tell the difference and you need to like emphasize it further. Yeah. And one thing that some people might want to fight me on <laughs> is the mix brush that I would always use 100% strength and then just um, sample my colors to create uh, gradients because when you work for DLC type of content, there's hundreds and hundreds of models. You want to keep consistency between the models it, because uh, it's really important to have that polished look on your product and you need the con consistency. You need to be super careful about your consistency. And the things that I don't recommend doing <laughs> Never go against the lighting of the scene. If you decide that you want to emphasize uh, lighting, um, 
ne, ne, well, you need to know what the lighting is, but ne, never go against it because if, if the light is coming from above and you sort of start emphasizing like one of the sides, uh, your model becomes much less readable and you try to avoid that at all costs because you're so, supposed to emphasize you don't try to overwrite. And you should always test palettes with multiple objects before you lock anything down because you want to avoid that variance and you want to make sure that uh, your colors look nice on across multiple items that what might look good on a single item might not work on something else and then you're sort of stuck with it and you don't want that and consistency 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 <laughs> never work on isolated on a single model without looking at your previous work at least from time to time because it, it, consistency is the one thing you don't want to mess up and Another thing interesting is that uh, I want to tell that uh, never cheap out on polygons. It might sound a uh, really weird thing to say for <laughs> low poly art, but uh, actually like uh, there is such a thing that's too, too little <laughs> because uh, you see often that young artists, they, um, they are su super proud. They make this model that it, it's only 200 polygons. The, the, this is so nice. And then they slap a 4K texture on it. And the, then they are confused why um, the art test uh, didn't go well and they didn't get the job. <laughs> so <laughs> so I think it's 90% uh, 90 90 of the time, you, if you can add the poly count a little and get nice results, uh, it's better than uh, upping the texture like almost always. So uh, what I learned from Hotel Hideaway, um, so most of the work, like I mentioned, um, was like working with amb ambient occlusion. So a lot of uh, the, these points uh, are about working with ambient occlusion. So you, you would always, um, the one thing I found useful was to use vertex group to remember selections. If, if I went like back and forth and tried to tweak things, there might be like plugins that you can like select the color areas, but um, I, I was more comfortable with this, so I would do this and uh, you wouldn't need an external plugin, you could do this in Blender and always test with multiple colors. Uh, we had the system where the customer could uh, purchase an item and then choose the colors of the item. There were four slots for colors and uh, I have this trench coat as an example here that um, if the customer can choose something uh, and you would think that they will only do like logical combinations that they really don't, they might do anything. <laughs> so um, this was like a, one of the decisions we had to make that we have this trench code and now it looks nice on beige, but then somebody might want it like a navy blue and you cannot see any of my vertex color work. And then sometimes if you cannot make both of them look nice, you kind of just have to decide that uh, you, you need to know your customer and try to decide what, what they like better and optimize for that and just uh, try to go with that. And also one, one thing that uh, is important about AO is that it's very subtle work. Best makeup is no makeup. And, it's, it's uh, really easy to overemphasize things and it, it just easily ends up looking fake. So you, you can like emphasize things, but uh, you need to be subtle. When it becomes obvious, it doesn't look nice anymore. And if you use vertex colors for like uh, pa painting, like you paint all the colors, uh, I would recommend using this old concept art trick of that darker colors are always slightly more saturated than uh, lighter colors. and it just makes things pop in a really nice way. So uh, here's another example from Hotel Hideaway. Um, I was able to add another public room. We, we called them public rooms. They were these uh, chat, chat rooms that uh, the players could go to. Uh, I was able to make a public room uh, with my own design. Um, the, it had the project name Shady Club. And what I think is cool about this work is that uh, there's only two textures in this image. The other one is the wooden floor on the main room and the other one is the toilet floor. And then there's one light bake, but nothing else is a texture here, nothing else at all. So I think it looks really nice and it, it, it runs super well because it's, um, it, the, 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 you don't need to process like almost any textures at all. So I, I was really happy how this room turned out. <laughs> and. <coughs> If some of you are thinking of uh, trying vertex colors yourself, uh, 
I have like a short list of uh, common issues that you might run into and you might want to look out for. So um, w one of the things that people get confused is like uh, that your colors look washed out uh, in, in the game engine and there's like no obvious explanation for it and then you get depressed and don't want to do vertex colors anymore. <laughs> But that is usually because uh, Blender uses RPG, uh, SRPG mode and most game engines use linear. So if you have the opportunity to access the exporter, change the color space to linear and uh, all is well. And if it's a custom solution by your company and you cannot uh, change it by hand, then you can just add a power node in Unity or Unreal with the value of 2.2 and that will offset the colors from uh, SRGP to linear. So you can do either of these things and it, it fixes the issue. Of course, it's always better to use as little nodes as possible in game engine to avoid your material getting complicated. But in case you, you have an exporter that you cannot change by hand, then just add the power node and it's, it's fine. And uh, I'm not sure like how obvious this, this thing here is, but um, sometimes you get this like, weird spike in your shading. And that is because uh, Everything is always triangles and Blender is just sort of like, a, it has already decided that if you convert this to triangles, which way would the triangles go? And that, that's, that's the way the spike goes. So sometimes it just messes with your coloring and you just simply need to divide the square in the opposite way and it usually makes the shading look a lot nicer. And you might have the same issue with normal artifacts and you can use the same solution for that. And another one that uh, usually people are confused about that they try to make sharp edges and uh, for so some reason Blender just refuses to give you sharp edges <laughs> on vertex colors. And um, that is usually because there are two types of uh, default set settings for vertex colors. And if you go to vertex painting mode and just start painting, the settings are correct by default. But uh, if you create the vertex color layer without going to the paint mode, it's wrong by default. How nice. <laughs> it's probably right by default for something else, but not for this. So you can just uh, set the domain to face corner and the data type to byte color, and th then you can do sharp corners. And if you have the wrong settings by default, you can actually convert it. You don't need to recreate the layer to get it back. But this is something that a lot of people get stuck on, like, why can't I get sharp, co <laughs> sharp co corners? What am I doing wrong? And another <laughs> uh, surprise is that um, polycount might be higher in uh, game engine than it was in Blender. And this might be a really scary surprise if you are taking an art test and the company gave you like really strict poly budget and you, you were everything was under control and then you took it to the engine and nothing was under control anymore. <laughs> so wh why is that? What, what makes the po poly count go up? Uh, it's actually pretty interesting because um, sharp edge and sharp vertex color edge actually behave in the same way. So if you have like a sharp color transition, it, it will be interpreted as two edges. So that will sort of double those vertices in the count. And this shows up only after export. How nice. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and actually one thing I noticed that UV islands do the same. So if you have like a ton of UV islands, it actually that takes your vertex count. It makes your vertex count go up. And that's something that a lot of people don't know about. <laughs> and sadly, there is no magic button for this. <laughs> Uh, best I can do is tell you that uh, you need to use sharp edges sparingly. <laughs> um, try to think about if it will be visible from the angle of the game and just um, if it's not, uh, maybe consider if like, do you, do you need it after all? And another thing is that you can um, fake sharpness quite well with normals sometimes. So I, I would recommend doing the data transfer modifier and trying to play around with normals and see if you can get away with it. And one thing is just to Try to be preemptive with your polys. That just be aware that you don't like try to max it out in Blender, and then you have a surprise waiting in Unity, <laughs> and then then you panic and <laughs> miss your deadline. But yeah, so so you did these nice vertex colors, and uh, 
you cannot see anything in Unity and you want to throw your laptop out of the window again. <laughs> so um, wh why is that? Why cannot you see anything? Well, um, there, m there might be two reasons for it. Uh, your shader might not be expecting vertex colors. It's not being told that you need to put them in, or then they didn't get imported at all in the first place. So first you should uh, uh, check that um, you have a vertex uh, color node uh, as part of your shader setup. That there you can see like a couple of comparisons. You have the setup in Unreal and then you have it in Unity. So it's, and then I had, I, and here I have the corrective power um, 2.2 node in case um, Unity convert from sRGB to linear. And here is a short list of uh, formats that support vertex colors. So the safe, as you can see, the safest bets are GLTF and FBX. Uh, I was told that the uh, vertex color alpha channel is supported by uh, GLTF, but uh, I couldn't get it to work. But if somebody has gotten that to work, I, I want to know the solution. <laughs> but FBX is the safe bet here. So um, now, have, now that we have talked about vertex colors uh, as in a traditional sense, uh, I want to observe them as like more like information maps and carriers of information. So here I like to use the term programmer's mindset when the artist is thinking in nice colors and painting the first thing programmer thinks is uh, what can I do with it? Uh, what can I do with this? Uh, and programmers uh, don't uh, like uh, consider that things are the, for certain things, they, the names of sockets are just words to them. <laughs> if you can plug it something in there and uh, make a funny effect with, with it, they will do that. And it's all about doing more with less. And uh, I think this is a learned trait for artists, but the good news is that it can be learned. <laughs> you can think like a programmer when you observe them in nature long enough. <laughs> and, it's the difference is like um, artists think, tends to think texture, uh, vertex colors as, as like an alternative to texturing, but um, programmer thinks them more like shader component, like how can I make this shader run better with my vertex colors? And I think uh, at the beginning, the game industry did use vertex colors mostly like a cheap textual replacement, but uh, then they have had, th th that has expanded a lot and evolved into various other, to fit various other needs. Like, uh, for example, here you can see I'm uh, pushing the vertex, uh, 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 I'm pushing the emission of these lamps into vertex alpha channel. So I'm, I'm painting them with regular colors and I'm pushing the emission to alpha so you can have this uh, nice glow effect. And you don't need to unwrap anything to achieve this result. And, I think it's beneficial both for humans and computers because <laughs> shaders run better without textures and uh, artists can prototype faster when you don't need to unwrap anything and can just like uh, try things to see if they look nice or not. And uh, here is like the um, artistic uh, perspective versus the technical one that uh, artistic thing, uh, artist thinks like uh, well, styles and uh, gradients and uh, translucency light, uh, unlit, what kind of effects I can do. Um, the, it's, it's like the straightforward approach that you, you can use uh, a, you, you use, um, do AO with multiply and have like a cheap ambient occlusion effect. You can store baked lighting data. It's like um, you see what you get versus what would you like to get. So the te technical artist is thinking more like, uh, what would I actually like to get? I, would I like some uh, emission in certain places? Would I like some transparency? Do I want to mark stuff out with like a clown mask to uh, uh, refer to it in my code? Uh, do, you want, do I want to describe uh, roughness, metallic, uh, ambient? Uh, do I want to blend terrains? Uh, do I want to uh, combine with the height lerp and have like really nice looking terrain blending? Do I want to use it as a movement guide? Uh, do I want to... For example, I could simulate like movement of fish or birds without using bones because bones cost a lot in mobile. So you could just like uh, paint a black and white mask and uh, tell that um, the white means that uh, it moves a lot and the black means that it moves very little and you could get like really nice looking fish with no bones and stuff like that. So it's like uh, the straightforward the straightforward approach versus what would you like to have? What, what, what should I put in here to get what I want? But uh, of course, there's always limitations. Uh, 
what you can do with this uh, because of the game engines mostly. And one really unfortunate limitation is that uh, Unity and Unreal both only support one, they import only one set of vertex colors. And there might be ways around it, but they are very difficult to achieve and you will be fighting windmills <laughs> if you do that, uh, just, just don't. It, it's, it's not a good solution until they add that support themselves, I think. And of course, you have a limited amount of channels. You have red, green, blue, and alpha. So that's four channels of data. So you can describe only so much, even if you channel back and use them all, you, you still have four channels. And one thing that um, is, is, is a bit frustrating is that isolating a color channel in Blender is quite tricky at the moment. Um, you can... I, well, I'm, I'm using geometry nodes to work around it, and I'll be showcasing that later, but um, I, I currently, I don't like to say bad things about Blender because I genuinely love Blender with all my heart, but I really hate that alpha tool. It's super sloppy to work with it. So, yeah, and if, if I could make one wish for the Blender cards, please add a button to isolate a color channel for vertex colors. I, I, that would make me so happy, please, <laughs> pretty please. And um, then, then there is, of course, the structure of your model. Like I said, that if you have too little geometry, you might just have too little to work it. Your colors become muddy. And then you just need to push more poly count so you can get like the support, uh, you, you can su support the results you want. And usually this results in like slightly denser mesh. And it, because you sort of, sometimes you need to sort of like, um, burn things in, so to say, if you want like very specific gradients and you must will become harder to edit because of this. So it's a trade-off, of course. And editing existing vertex colors in Unity and Unreal is, 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 is quite hard because it's not really meant for that. There are tools for it and you can, but it, it's not meant to be like that. So you, that results in going back and forth between Blender and Unity quite a lot when you're tweaking things and checking out if things look nice. But there is always a loophole <laughs> when you look for hard enough. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to use the next couple of slides to tell about the loopholes I have developed. Uh, so one thing you can, um, I, I'm, I'm actually really um, sad that my um, LibreOffice deck didn't work because I had really nice um, GIFs here. <laughs> that could demonstrate what I mean better. So sorry about that. I wasn't able to use it. But uh, one thing to pass around limitations is that you can use like hue shifting with a custom script. Uh, here I, ha I had this project, I had a long street of houses and I had this basic yellow house and I wanted some variation. So I just added a hue node to my vertex colors in Unity. And th then I made a couple of variations of my mat uh, material and then um, I got a script from programmer that I was able to overwrite the previous material with my material. So I was able to get like all the color variations for the houses I wanted, but they technically used the first house I made. So I didn't have to like uh, chuckle multiple assets. It's the same prefab all the time, but I, I just uh, hue shifted with the custom script on the fly to get some little variation in. And it's really good technique for like large environments when you just need like a little bit of variation and it goes a long way. And there's another thing I like to do um, when you want to achieve a sort of like a channel uh, packing P PBR thing going on. Um, you can uh, actually, you probably know that you can channel back textures like roughness to green and ambient occlusion to blue and so on, but you can actually, nothing prevents you from doing the same with vertex colors. Um, there's a really nice plugin for that called Vertex Color Master. Uh, there, there you can see my nodes um, that from Blender. Uh, the first setup, uh, you have like a color layers for uh, each uh, channel separately, and then you just combine them with Geo Winter nodes. You push the colors and the alpha to the same model. And then uh, below it, you can see like if you, if you wanna push like a different data to each channel, that's how you do it. And there's also a really good uh, plugin for channel packing and is isolating vertex channels called Vertex Color Master. It's uh, free. 
Uh, it used to be broken for a while and I was really sad about it, but uh, actually like a little bit before this conference I checked on it again and now it works and it's a super nice plugin for, plug for Vertex Color Work in Blender, can recommend that. And if you don't want to try the plugin, uh, then you can use my setups here if you just want to channel back data. Uh, this is how you can work around the issue that it's hard to isolate a channel then you can just have like, have like multiple vertex uh, color layers and just like ram, in, ram them into one when you are ready. <laughs> because um, you want to optimize things. And this is another favorite technique of mine. <laughs> Abusing UV islands <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, UV coordinates actually um, are values that can go from one to uh, zero to one and from left to right, and game engines can import multiple sets of UV. I don't know if there's a hard limit for it, but at least a lot of set of UVs. And material ports actually accept numeric inputs. They don't say that they do, but they do. So nothing uh, prevents you from actually pulling the data from your um, UV location and using that as roughness or um, metallic or stuff like that so you actually move the uv coordinates and you get like a yeah you 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 get sort of like a ppr effect that way so that that's something i have done in my personal projects and then you can just throw like uh, the regular vertex colors on top of that and suddenly you have a very cheap flexible uh, low-end ppr shader here is an um, example uh, of where, where i've used this workflow this is from unreal and um, on the left side, you can see Blender, uh, how I place the UV islands from left to right and up and down. The metallic goes like up and down and the roughness goes from left to right. And I just uh, move the, uh, I, collapse the, I collapse the UV coordinates of the area I want in, into a single dot. And then I just move the dot around uh, until it's like uh, the amount of shiny I want and then the amount of metallic I want. And here is this uh, small plate of um, chocolate cake that you can see I have a metallic spoon and uh, cherry and some really mat mat mate looking <laughs> cake and in in the uh, lower box i'm, I'm just uh, taking the texture coordinates in unreal and i'm just splitting them into and i'm i'm routing them to metallic and roughness and that's really it <laughs> that's all there is to it and you can um, do like a lot of clutter items this way if you have like a huge scene and nothing gets looked up too up close and all you want to do is some like some sense of pbr but um it, it, you would lose your mind if you textured everything. Well, don't do this <laughs> instead. Feel free to steal. <laughs> and here's like an example of it. Uh, you can see these uh, chairs and the cups and the uh, cake and the plates. There, there's, there are no textures in it. Uh, of course, the tablecloth has a texture in it, but the chairs don't and the cups don't and the liquid doesn't. And, and it's all using that one shader I showed you. And if you look this far away, you can certainly get away with it <laughs> or if you want a stylized look then it looks nice up close if you want to go for more stylized stuff this is uh, rendered in unreal and so uh, my conclusion uh, about my about what we have gone through today uh, this is only scratching the surface. This was really only an introduction what you can do, like different combinations of this. Uh, different situations require a bit uh, different shader building. Uh, if you know how to code at least a little, you can do almost anything. <laughs> and why you would do any of this is because you want to optimize the crap out of your game. <laughs> Uh, because nobody likes a laggy game. You probably don't like anything laggy, but the game will annoy you the most. <laughs> and this is, this is why you would do any of this. And I think I, I will encourage you to always ask, like, what, what do you really need? Like, really, really need? Like, uh, are you making a huge hero item uh, that you are going to take 4K images out of? Or are you making modeling of flower waste and it's going to sit in a corner of a room and... <laughs> no, gonna be pictured from 10 meters away like you genuinely don't need to torture yourself by un unwrapping that and using time for that <laughs> it doesn't make sense and then there's always the question realism versus stylized like if you want absolute realism then uh, texturing 
is unavoidable, but if you're making stylized products, you can get away with so much with just vertex colors and pulling some shader tricks. And I think a lot of people texture like out of habit that it's just the way things are and they think that there are no alternatives. And I understand it very well because if you are busy, it's easy to fall into old routines when deadlines are pushing in and you are stressed. And I guess my message is that uh, be always curious, <laughs> explore. Um, uh, remember the names of sockets are just words. <laughs> And uh, I just generally think that vertex colors are really great and often ignored, and I think they deserve more love. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you want to be friends with me in LinkedIn, uh, <laughs> I, I, I love to be friends with people. <laughs> <laughs>